simple truth. Um, all right, grab your Bible and you can open it to the book of uh, Proverbs, um, chapter number 26. I'm actually not going to start there. I'll be, be along there here after a while, but uh, that's one part I'm going to probably read a little bit more from, so I'll give you a head start. Proverbs chapter number 26. I want everybody to grab your Bible and I want you to hold it up. Hold it up high. Yeah. Look at all those cell phones. <laughs> If you, hey, own it. Oh, if you got this uh, Bible app on your cell phone, that, uh, hold it up high. It's, hey, it doesn't matter whether it's a leather cover or a screen, as long as you got the word in you, amen? How many of you still believe in this? Hold it up high. I, want, I still want to see it. How many of you still believe in the power of this book? Amen. How many of you still believe this is God's word? Amen. How many of you believe that when we read and we take the advice and the counsel from this book, it is a blessing for our life? Amen. How many of you still believe, based on the scripture, that this book, God's word, is a lamp to our feet? And it is a light into our pathway. We still respect it. We still honor it. And we still believe it to be true today. Say amen. 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 So I'm going to read from you Psalm chapter 14, verse 1. This verse will be on your screen. A very short verse. But this is where I'm going to take my text for the message today. Psalm 14, 1 just simply says, The fool says in his heart, there is no God. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. The title of my message today is, I pity the fool. Let's pray. <laughs> <laughs> Heavenly Father, we love you today. We are so honored to be your people, to come together in this place at this appointed time on a Sabbath, a, a day that, that you appointed for us, for our benefit, that we might come here and, and have rest not only in our bodies from work, but in our soul. Time that we can gather in your presence, Lord, and just hear you speak into our hearts and into our minds through your word. We've declared this morning we still put our faith and our confidence in your word. And it's only by the power of the Holy Ghost can it be preached. I ask this morning as a vessel that you would help me not to speak not one word of my own opinion, that I won't say one word and I won't hold one word back, but that you, through your power, through your anointing, would speak to every heart and every life, that there be no hindrance today. We pray in Jesus' name. And everybody say amen. 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 I pity the fool. How many of you under the age of 25 knows who Mr. T is? Raise your hand. There's a few. How many of you in this room have absolutely no idea who Mr. T is? Raise your hand. There's, there's a few, all pretty much young. Keena, you don't know who Mr. T is? Oh, Kurt. Where's Kurt? Man, he has failed. You tell Kurt, he's got some work to do. Um, now, there's a show a long time ago when I was a quick kid. This is a long, long time ago. Uh, called the A. It was the A Team, and it was a movie about a show about special forces. Anyway, Mr. T was I pity the fool, right? Something of that nature. He said it a little deeper than I do, um, but ultimately, what he was saying was, he, you know, anybody that would cross him, he considered to be a fool, right? And he felt sorry for them, their outcome. What does it mean? Basically, if somebody crossed him, he was going to whoop them, right? I pity the fool. And so, that seems, I know that seems a little uh, silly, but this is actually, uh, I, I told Tina on the way here, I told her the title of my message. I said, it sounds kind of uh, silly, but this is actually a pretty serious uh, message. When we look at what the scripture says concerning um, the person who is a fool, what the Bible considers to be a fool. And so, there's, and it has a lot to say about it. We can't cover even all of it today in one, in one sermon, but um, there, were a lot, there were some things as the Lord kind of began to, 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 to bake if you will, this message in my mind, certain scriptures that kind of stood out to me that I want to share with you um, today. So a fool actually by definition is um, a silly or stupid person, someone who lacks judgment or sense, okay? Someone that has no sense, no sense of judgment. Okay, so the scripture that we read says a fool, the fool says there is, the last part of that verse says they are corrupt. Who's they? The fool that says there is no God. They are corrupt and they do abominable deeds. There is none who does good. There's no good in them. They do abominable deeds. So if you take someone who considers himself to be an atheist, okay, which means they do not believe in any kind of God. Um, the reason why many people call themselves atheists, the reason why they don't want to believe in God is because they don't want to answer for their deeds, right? Their deeds are wicked. They want to do what they want to do. And if, if you believe in God, then you have to believe that you'll answer to that God. And they don't want to answer to a God because they want to be able to do whatever they want to. I remember watching Billy Graham one time and he said, he, his belief was that there are no true atheists. Nobody really truly doesn't believe in God because when it comes down to it, when tragedy strikes their life, you know what they start doing? Calling out to the God that they say they don't believe in. But the person who says, because there's no, the only alternative that we have in this day and age. Now, nobody understands God in this human mind, 
We can't fathom and understand God. And so for some people, I get ahead of myself a little bit, but for some people, they would look at us who believe in a God that we can't see and we really can't fully and completely explain. There's all these questions, where'd God come from, blah, blah, blah. And we can't fully comprehend or explain God. And so people would look at us and say, well, that's foolish to believe in God. But what's the alternative, right? That two uh, little particles billions of years ago and where the bar- particles come from, we, nobody knows, but two particles slammed together really hard and, and formed an atom, and you know, from there, there was a little pool of scum, and I like the way D.L. puts it. He said, out of that pool of scum, cl- climbs this little creature, and eventually it grows a beard and starts driving a truck. <laughs> that's, that's the David Levin special. But everything that exists today, all the variety of animals and the humans and everything exists because over billions of years, it just formed and all of this stuff come. Folks, I don't have enough faith to believe that. That takes faith to believe that. And the scripture just as plain says, anybody who believes that is a fool, right? And so the, what the, the reason why the world is in such a bad shape that it's in today is because it is run by fools. People who have denied the existence, the authority, the supreme authority of Almighty God. We do away with him. We build our own God. We build our own society. And that leaves nothing but chaos in its path. Right? So I personally believe, this is just, this is just my opinion. I personally believe that the, the amount of people who honestly believe in the Big Bang. I'm going somewhere with this, so kind of hang with me. The, 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 the number of people who honestly believe in the Big Bang and that's where everything comes from through, through evolution, I believe that that number of people is actually very small. I don't believe that the majority of people, you would think the way that it's presented in the world around us, the majority of people believe that way. I don't think the majority of people believe that way. I think the majority of people can look around and see the design that is in creation and at least come to the conclusion that if there's a design, there has to be a designer. So not everybody that believes in God is believing the right thing, but I think most people will, will uh, look around and say, okay, somebody was behind putting this all together. I can't believe it all just, by some freak of nature, it all happened. I think it's a very small number of people who believe it that way. The problem is this, that, that minority, that small number of people who, believe, who really believe that way are the people who are in control. The people who, the, the, um, the professors in the universities, Right? That's actually a relatively small number of people, but they're in control of a lot of minds. Media, scientists, so all these people who believe are small, but they have, a, they have a platform, they have influence, which makes it appear as though most people believe that way, when in reality, I don't believe that they do. I believe that most people can believe in God, but here's the thing this morning. Believing in God, believing in a creator, is not enough to be saved. Amen? We have to believe the right thing about God, and we'll get to that here in just a minute, but... There's that minority that are in those places, and there's a lot of people who say they believe in God, but they live as though they don't. And you can listen to a lot of politicians, and they'll talk about God. Most politicians don't get up and, and claim to believe the Big Bang. Most politicians, what will they say when there's, when there's tragedy in the country? They'll, they'll ask everybody to what? To pray, right? So most politicians will claim to believe in God, but they don't legislate as though they believe in God. You can't. If you honestly believe in God, and, I'm, and this is, I'm not soapboxing here, let me just make this point. If we honestly believe in, in, in God and that we will answer to God and that God protects life, you can't legislate something like abortion that, that murders babies, right? So they say they believe in God, but they act and they legislate as, as though they don't. Um, so they, they're kind of in the same lot as the person who just simply says, there is no God. So I said all that to say this, when it comes to the fool, the Bible says the fool says there is no God. Man's definition of foolish is much different than God's definition of foolish. So let's look at it from man's perspective. What, what does mankind consider to be a fool? Everybody who's in this room right now today, the world would consider us foolish. Let's look at the scripture from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. For the, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. Who, who is those that perish? The unbeliever, right? Those, the, those who, who are ultimately are bound for hell. The preaching of the cross to them is foolishness. We are a fool to believe that a man, that God came and became human being, died on the cross and then raised again from the dead. To, to the world who can that's foolish to believe that. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Amen. We have believed in that message and it has changed our life. How many of you have been changed this morning? 
The power of the gospel, the power of the cross has changed our life. God says you're a fool if you don't believe it. The world says you're a fool if you do. Do we really care what the world thinks in the end? The scripture says, let God be true and all men a liar. Do you want God to look at you and see fool? Or do you want the world to look at you and see fool? Goes on to say this, for it is written... I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. In other words, man's wisdom, they didn't know God. I think it's in Romans, I think it's in Romans where Paul says they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. What does it mean? They don't believe in God because they don't want to believe in God. And in fact, that same scripture, God goes on to say that really people who don't believe in God are without excuse because creation itself declares that there is a God. Okay? So he goes on to say those, you know, in the wisdom, by, by man's wisdom, they did not know God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. The foolishness of preaching you know, I know y'all sitting back thinking, I knew he was a fool, right? If God, no, wonder, no wonder God calls people like me to preach. There's the foolishness of preaching. Really, in reality, this shouldn't be necessary, right? Every person should have enough sense. What is a fool? Someone who doesn't have sense or judgment. Every human being really should have enough sense because God has given every one of us a measure of faith to be able to look around to, to see how the, the, how many turkey hunters are out there. You, you see how the, the hen, there's a hen and there's a gobbler. There's nothing in between. There's a male and there's a female in, in every species. But to watch how they come together and mate in order to uh, you know, further the, the species. How that, that big fireball that we see in the sky, finally we're seeing that big fireball in the sky. Here lately it's been rainy. But it's burned since the beginning of time and continues to burn and the world revolves I mean the, the universe so to see all of this take place the creation itself declares that there is a God so this shouldn't be necessary in that every person should be able to exercise that little bit of faith God gave them look around and say yeah there's a God so if there's a God then I better get to know him amen and God says if we want to know him he'll make himself real to us but we preach, and so this to the world, foolishness for me to, to devote my life to preaching the gospel, it's foolish to those who don't understand the power that is in this gospel. He goes on to say this, for the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto Greeks foolishness. So what does it mean by that? Number, number one, you got... Think back to Paul's day when he's writing this and you got the Jewish people who are basically hinging everything on the Old Testament scriptures, right? Everything that the, everything that the prophets said, uh, you know, concern. and in the Old Testament scriptures, it says, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, okay? Anybody who was crucified is what it's getting at, is cursed by God. And so if you're a Jewish person in this day and you're coming along and you're going to tell a Jewish person, Jesus died on the cross and we must honor him. You see how that's foolish to a Jewish person who has had it grained in their mind? No, anybody who dies on a cross is a fool. They're cursed by God. That's, that's silly to put, to put honor and to worship somebody who has died on a cross. That's what, that's what Paul is saying here to the, to the Jews. It's, it's foolishness. The Greeks who seek after wisdom, and you think about the Greeks in that day would have been like the Romans who would go and they had all of these meeting places where philosophers would get together and talk about, you know, the meaning of life and they would, you know, all, all these kinds of things and they're looking for some sort of, you know, knowledge, enlightenment, if you will. And so if you were to tell a Greek person uh, to believe in Jesus, they're like, wait a minute, you're wanting me to follow a God who was killed by his enemies? I mean, he comes along and he's got all this power to heal and do all of these types of things, but then his enemies, the Romans, murdered him and you're wanting me to follow him as a God? See how foolish that is to somebody who doesn't understand that because Jesus died on the cross and rose again, you and I have eternal life. Doesn't make any sense. It's foolishness. The unbelievers today, it's foolish, you know, it's foolish to waste a good spring day like this to come in here and listen to people sing songs and raise your hands. That's, that's foolish. Raise your hand and worship a God that you can't see. You could be turkey hunting. White bass ought to be running pretty good by now. It's a good spring day. Foolish 
to give up a day like that to come in here and worship God, especially one who died 2,000 years ago. That's to the unbeliever, the foolish, the fool who says there is no God. 1 Corinthians 2 says, the, the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned or spiritually understood. You and I, as human beings, understand most things based on our human nature. But God says, when it comes to the things of God, when it comes to the cross, what salvation is really all about, what life is really all about, cannot be understood by the human mind. Our five senses, right? Sight, smell, taste, feel, sound. The five senses, that's what we live by in this world as human beings. We trust those five senses. And they save us a lot. They, the sense of touch, you know not to, if something's hot, that sense of touch keeps you from hurting yourself horribly. So we need those five senses in the natural sense. But when it comes to our walk with God, when it comes to our spiritual life, those five senses are absolutely useless. Our five senses are gone. The Bible says that we don't walk by sight, we walk by faith. Spiritually understood, meaning the closer I get to God and the more I seek God, the more his spirit reveals to me what truth is. The world can't understand that, therefore it is foolish to them. Now we look at, that's man's view, but I think it's more important that we understand what God views to be a fool. Uh, fair warning, is you probably hear something today that might make you see a little fool in yourself. Amen? I have. In Luke chapter 12, Jesus tells a parable. I'm going to read this for you and we'll talk about it. He tells a parable about a man that he considered to be a fool. And let's, let's, let's pick through his life just a little bit and see what we can, if we can determine what it was, at what point he went wrong and what considered him a fool. He told them a parable saying, the land of a rich man produced plentiful. Is, that, is he a fool because of that? Because, no, I mean, that, that's good. It's one thing that the scripture teaches us that it's, a person is pretty wise if they can take something and, and turn it, make it bigger. In other words, you take a little money and turn a profit or you take a few seeds and you grow a crop. So that's a good thing that we can multiply. This guy, he had a knack for producing and, and making and multiplying that that he had. That wasn't, it wasn't a fool because of that. He produced plentiful. He thought to himself, what shall I do for I have nowhere to store my crops? He said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns, build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. Uh, is, is this what made him a fool? No, that's common sense. If you have, you farmers, if you, if you have a really good hay year, I mean, lots, lots of rain, and you produce a, a, a lot of hay, but you don't have enough barn space to, to store it, the natural thing would be, well, I'm going to build a bigger barn. Or I'm going to build some to put, to store it all. That's not foolish. That's, that's smart. That's good common sense. Here's where the guy went wrong. After he had all of these bigger barns and all of this stuff that was stored up, he said, I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, fool. This night your soul is required of you and the things you have prepared, the things you have grown, the things you have stored up, then whose will they be? Somebody else is going to eat that food you just put in the storage bin. So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. What made this guy a fool is when he began to start trusting in the works of his own hands. I worked hard. I got all that. I made good business decisions. I've got an IRA, I've got CDs, I've got stocks and bonds, and I have, and I have because of the work that I have done, and so now I can just rear back, take it easy, and just coast through life. That's what made him a fool. He was rich in man's eyes and had no need of anything. Rich towards, uh, had, had, he was, the Bible said he laid up treasures for himself, rich in worldly goods, but he was not rich towards God. He didn't look at his stuff and think to himself, maybe, how can I honor God with my increase? How can I help people with my increase? Everything was centered on him. There is no, there is no one more self-centered than a fool. A fool, by the way, 
I can't hit all of them, obviously, today. I'll hit some in Proverbs. But I would encourage you to read the book of Proverbs. The Proverbs talks an awful lot about the difference in the wise and the fool. And it, it sheds a lot of light on the subject. There are 31 chapters in Proverbs. Pick a, pick a chapter and re, read a chapter every day. In one month, you'll be through the book of Proverbs, and you'll find out if you're wise or if you're a fool, right? You'll find out pretty quickly, according to the scripture. But the man who was not rich towards God, he was concerned about what he had in this life. The Bible says it's so foolish. Because pursuing something that can be gone in a moment doesn't make a whole lot of sense if you think about it. Jesus said the treasures that we lay up in heaven, moths can't corrupt that. Rust can't corrupt that. Nobody can steal that. It, it lasts forever. Proverbs 21, 20 says, uh, precious treasure and oil are in a wise man's dwelling, but a fool, uh, a foolish man devours it. In other words, a fool makes no preparations for tomorrow. A fool is just worried about what he can get for today. A wise man will store up. He's thinking ahead. Look at that from a spiritual standpoint, folks. We, especially in this day and hour, and hour in, in America, where prosperity and we can we can have so much as Americans. And when we when we are all focused on how much I can get for myself, not stopping for just a moment, even though that one day this life will be over, and we don't give any account for that. We don't make any preparations for tomorrow. We're just focused on today. It's foolish. Yes, we live life. I think that we should live life. The Bible teaches us to, uh, Jesus said, occupy till I come. We have jobs. We need to make money. We need to store some back. We need to provide food and stuff for our kids. But folks, there is at some point we have to stop and, fo and plan for our spiritual, our eternity. One day we'll all stand before God. And if we stand before him with a lot of money in the bank and no riches toward God, no spiritual fruit, then we stand before him a fool. And that's not what God wants for us. The wise person thinks ahead and prepares. A wise person sees that I better prepare now because I may not be able to tomorrow. Remember, that's kind of happened with Joseph, right? Joseph was a wise man in that God had revealed to him that times were going to get tough. And so while things were good, he stored up and made preparations for the times when they wouldn't be so good. He didn't wait till the last minute. Oh, I'll, I'll cross that bridge when, when I get to it. I'm just going to live in the now. No, he was prepared and ready when hard times came. Look at that from a spiritual standpoint. Right now, in the United States of America, we have the freedom of religion. Right now, we can come here and we can gather on a Sunday morning or a Sunday night or Wednesday. We can, anytime we want to, we can come and gather here and we can worship God. Even though the world thinks it's foolish, we can still do it. We have that liberty. But we're little by little seeing those liberties being encroached upon. Little by little, politicians and uh, uh, those, those, uh, phlo philosophy, blah, 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 blah. Those, what's the word I'm looking for? Philosophers and, and uh, uh, university professors, thank you. I don't know why I cannot think of professor. Those, those, those fools in, the, in, the, in the, uh, you know, the colleges. Little by little, we're seeing this hostility against the gospel. Have you seen it? And those rights are being encroached upon. This, this, is, not a, this is not a scare attack message. It is a, let's use some common sense and not assume that everything's always going to be like this. Has it always been like this? Has every Christian since Jesus died been able to worship him freely without fear of persecution? No. Most Christians in 2,000 years have been persecuted for their faith. So think to yourself. Should I maybe, during this time, when I have the freedom and the liberty that I have, and I've got a Bible, I've got dozens of Bibles, should I not take advantage of this time and get the word in me? Would it not be foolish to wait till a time when the world says you can no longer worship Christ to just then decide to start getting closer to him? We, the wise man thinks about tomorrow and the fool just thinks about today. <clears throat> the wise man, the foolish man says, just eat it up, let the good times roll. Now, in Galatians, Paul writes this letter to the Galatians, and this is how, this is how, what he says to them, the exact words, he says, oh foolish Galatians, 
Who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun uh, by the spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Thinking anything will earn you favor with God and a spot in heaven other than the plain and simple faith of Jesus Christ is foolish. That's what happened in this church. Paul went into a country called, during his ministry, he went into a country called Galatia. And he preached the gospel and people got saved. That's what he was saying. You, you heard, it was by faith that you got saved. When I proclaimed to you the gospel, that guy that died on the cross and was buried and three days later he arose, I preached that message to you. You believed it. You were changed. You were saved. And, we, and then he established the church that they might carry on the gospel. But after Paul leaves, there are some religious people who creep, crept into that church and that those, I'm going to say something. Those religious people, I believe, there's a group of those religious people in every church that creep in and start saying things like, well, yes, we are saved because of the blood of Jesus, but you also have to do this. And you also have to do it this way. And you also have to do it like that. What they were saying was, yes, Jesus died and, and, and for us, and that's how we're saved, but you still have to obey the law. You still have to be circumcised. Because according to the old testament law a male after eight days had to be circumcised you still got to keep those feasts you still have to have all of those sabbath rules where you can't do anything but just sit like a zombie all day on the sabbath you know all of these rules so basically die, jesus died for us but you still have to do your part to earn salvation you have to look right sound right and and paul and the, the church bought it the Galatian church who had been saved by faith only, they bought this legalistic rule-keeping based salvation and they started to follow it and Paul catches wind of it. And he writes him this letter and he says, you're fools. You were saved by the gospel, not by what you did or how you did it. Folks, don't think for one second you and I are, are going to heaven or that God likes us best because we go to church more, or we do things this way or that way. The only way you and I are going to make it into heaven and it's going to be obvious when we get there is because of the blood of Jesus Christ and that's it. Amen. To think anything else is foolish. We have to learn to fully and completely rely on the goodness and the righteousness of Jesus Christ, not our own. There are no righteous people. None in the world. How many according to scripture? No, not one. There is one righteous and it is Christ. The fool thinks a little bit more highly of himself than he should. The fool thinks about how he keeps rules or goes to church or does all these things and puts himself above someone else who maybe does it a little different or somebody that, that doesn't go at all, somebody that doesn't know the Lord. The fool thinks a little bit more of himself, but the wise is humble. The wise man puts himself in a spot where he recognizes he is what he is and has what he has only by the grace of Almighty God. A fool trusts, uh, a wise recognizes his faults, but a fool doesn't think he has any. This is all scripture. I'm just, I'm, I'm kind of putting this together here because I don't want to read 2,700 verses to you today. But I do want to read these. In Proverbs chapter 26, you're probably there by now. Proverbs chapter 26, this whole, this whole chapter kind of deals with this topic here uh, verse one like snow in summer or rain in harvest so honor is not fitting for a fool how often do you see it snow in the middle of summer never it doesn't snow in the summer he said and the and the fool never gets honor he wants honor but he's never worthy of it because he's a fool like a sparrow in its flitting like a swallow in its flying a curse that is that is causeless does not alight a whip for a horse, a bridle for the donkey, and a rod for the back of fools. How do you, the only way to lead a horse is with a bridle, right? What he's saying is the only way to lead a fool is to beat him across the back, right? Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest you be like him yourself. You ever try to reason with a fool? You're like, well, maybe I'm the fool, right? How many of you ever been, how many of you ever been a fool? Let's just get that out of the way. We're all, we've all been foolish. But for somebody who is a true fool that doesn't have enough sense or judgment to make right decisions. You, you can't reason with a fool. 
God can get through to anybody, obviously. But the more you argue with a fool, we end up becoming foolish as well. The best thing we can do when we encounter a fool is just to walk away and leave him there. You young people who are, on the, who are getting close to graduating high school, some of you that have graduated high school, and you're about to go, this is one thing that kind of sparked this message for me this morning. So if, if, if you're not a fool and you don't encounter any and this message is for you, then you can tune me out the rest of the time. But I'm, I'm, a little, I'm concerned about our young people who graduate from high school and go to college, right? And we, we think about this a little bit more right now in this day and time because they're in that transition period. And thousands of young people who have been raised in church, church and raised to believe in God's word go to college and in a matter of days, their faith is destroyed because of some fool that stands up in front of the classroom and says, there is no God. I want to encourage you young people, when, you st- when you're in that situation, you go to college and I don't care which one it is, and you're sitting back there and you're, there's, there's a, a professor up there claiming what I've just said to you. I want you in the back of your mind to hear my voice and look at that person and say, he's a fool. He's a fool. It doesn't matter how many degrees he has behind his name, how many, uh, how many um, certificates he has behind his name, PhD, DDD, ADHD, I mean, whatever. Yeah, yeah, we got, I got that one. I'm a, I am a doctor in ADHD. No matter how smart he seems, that's what the scripture is getting across, is that no matter how smart they are in man's wisdom, they're fools and they're wrong. Hallelujah. Don't argue with a fool, he goes on to say. Whoever, verse 6, sends a message by the hand of a fool, cuts off his own feet and drinks violence, you can't trust a fool to deliver a message. They're not, a fool is not trustworthy. Like a lame man's legs, which hang useless, is a proverb in the mouth of a fool. Anytime a fool tries to give you advice, it is as useless as somebody's paralyzed legs. Like one who binds the stone in the sling is one who gives honor to a fool. Like a thorn that goes up into the hand of a drunkard is a proverb in the mouth of a fool. How many of you have ever had a thorn go up your fingernail? Is that pleasant? No. You, a, a, a fool who claims to be wise is like that thorn up your fingernail. Like an archer, I like this one. Like an archer who wounds everyone. <laughs> okay, if you're going to shoot a bow, you got to have a little bit of sense. But like an archer who just shoots arrows and and, and, and shoots everybody in his sight is not is careless. That's someone who hires a fool. How many of you are supervisors and you've hired a fool or two in your day? They're not trustworthy. They don't show up on time. They're, causing, they're always causing problems. They're snarky. They, they talk behind everybody's back, right? Those fools, there's fools in the workplace. There's fools in the churches. Work behind everybody's back. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like a dog that returns to his own vomit is a fool who repeats his folly. A fool doesn't learn from his mistakes. Now, here's the thing. All of us have made mistakes in our life. Made foolish decisions and we've made mistakes. That's not, that's not the bad part because we've all done it. The bad part is when we never learn from our mistakes. See, the gospel is about restoring people. The gospel is about taking somebody in their mistakes and changing them and equipping them to move forward and to live different, right? God can take a a fool and turn him into the wise if he's willing, but a fool just continues back. It's like a a dog that returns to their own vomit. That's kind of gross, but dogs do that. I don't know why they do that, but they do that. So was the man who just continues back in his own folly over and over again. Ecclesiastes has a lot to say about fools as well. Ecclesiastes chapter 5 says, Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. To draw near to listen is better than to offer the sacrifice of fools. For they do not know that they are doing evil. Be not rash with your mouth. This one, listen, if, this, if nothing else I've said today doesn't get you, this one will get you because this one gets me. Be not rash with your mouth. Speak, quick to speak. Nor let your heart be hasty to utter a word before God, for God is in heaven and you are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few, for a dream comes with such business and a fool's voice with many words. I think there's another translation that said, a fool is known by his many words. 
a lot of speaking, a fool doesn't know when to shut his mouth. That's where I probably fall into the fool section more than anything. You've heard the old saying, it's better, better to keep our mouth shut and everybody think we're a fool than to open our mouth and remove all doubt, right? Then to begin speaking and everybody go, yep, I thought he was a fool. And then when he opened his mouth, I had no doubt he was a fool, right? Because a fool, a fool can't guard or harness his tongue. James gives a pretty good picture of the tongue and how even though it's one of the smallest parts of our body, it causes us the most problems. The tongue is like a fire. You can, you can start, you can burn down the entire Mark Twain National Forest with one match. And you can cut down somebody's character. You can destroy somebody's confidence. You can wreck a church or a business or a family with one word because we can't keep our thoughts and our opinions to ourselves. The Bible teaches us that the wise will conceal a matter. In other words, if I hear something about somebody or somebody brings a complaint to me, a wise person will eat it. It just it dies with me. But a fool has to repeat it, right? Doesn't, does that convict anybody else? Some of you are thinking, you're a fool because I'm going to stone you when I get in the parking lot, right? Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 9 says, Be not quick in your spirit to become angry, for anger lodges in the heart of fools. A fool is angry all the time, gets angry quick, stays angry longer, harbors bitterness and unforgiveness. Anger lodges in the heart of a fool. But to the wise, to the believer, to the one who is putting their trust in God, mercy comes in and softens that. It gives us the power and the ability to forgive people when they've wronged us. Uh, Ecclesiastes 10 says, Dead flies make the perfumer's ointment give off a stench, so a little folly outweighs wisdom and honor. Get that. A little folly outweighs sometimes our better judgment. A wise man heart. A wise man's heart inclines him to the right, but a fool's heart to the left. Even when the fool walks on the road, he lacks sense, and he says to everyone that he is a fool. The fool walks on the road. Can you imagine, if you're, if you're driving down the four lane, and there's a lot of, we got a highway patrolman right here. Uh, Jeff, if you were driving down patrolling the highway, and there was a guy walking right down the center yellow lane in the middle of high traffic, would you consider him to be a fool? Say, Dennis, we're going to have a conversation. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, you're not supposed to use my name. That happened with us. He saw me. No. If it's somebody walking down the middle of the highway, he's, he's letting everybody know he's a fool, right? By his actions. There's no doubt. What a fool. He lacks judgment. He lacks sense that he would walk down the middle of the road like that. Yeah. Our, our foolishness finds its way out because foolishness ultimately comes from the core of who we are. It all boils down to this. I said every, all that to say this and bring it back here to Matthew chapter 27. When Jesus preaches the Sermon on the Mount and he covers so many topics, everything from the fact that sin is not just the act of committing sin, but it's the thinking about it as well. You know, adultery is not just committing adultery, but it's, it's thinking, having lustful thoughts about somebody in your mind is adultery. He talks about letting our light shine before men. He talks about in the Sermon on the Mount things like, you know, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Think about other people above yourself at times. So Jesus covers so many different um, teachings in the Sermon on the Mount. And when he's wrapping up this great sermon, and by the way, you should, every Christian, every Christian should be familiar with Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. That's the Sermon on the Mount. If you claim to be a follower of Jesus Christ, you need to be familiar with at least those three chapters because Jesus covers so many things in that sermon. But when he's done with that sermon and he brings it all to a close, this is what he says to finalize it. Everyone then who hears these words of mine, everything he just got done teaching, everyone who hears these words and does them, they apply it to their life, will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock or on a solid foundation. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock, his word, his teaching. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them, but ignores them, will be like a foolish man, a fool, who built his house on the sand 
And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. So in both of these, he's talking about two different types of people here, a wise person and a foolish person. Both of these people endured rain and wind storms, right? And those represent the hard times in life. Death of a loved one, loss of a job, sickness, you name it. Everything that makes life so hard, wise people and foolish people all go through those things. Believers and unbelievers all go through those things. Those who follow and believe in the, in, in the message of the cross and the fools who say there are, is no God, everybody goes through those things. And Jesus said uh, the difference in whether or not we stand and how we stand before God ultimately all hinges on what we did when we heard his word. This Bible that we held up, that we all acknowledged to be God's word that we neglect so much. The one who ignores this and builds his life on his own money, on his own talents, on what everybody else thinks, on what the professors in the college told me, is like somebody who would build their house on sand. What happens when you build your, if you were to build your house on sand, say you go down to the beach. Have you ever built a sand castle? Have you ever been to Florida, you've been to the beach, you built a sand castle. Does that castle stay for, from now on? What happens when the tide comes in? It washes it away because sand is, sand is shaky. It moves. It, there's nothing solid about it. And that, this, this entire world and all the sins and all the pleasures that this world holds is like sand. It's constantly moving, constantly shifting. Try to, try to keep up with the fads for crying out loud. Right? Something's in style now. About the time I get in style, it changes and I'm out of style again. That's the way the world works, constantly shifting. And you've got to try to keep up with everybody in order to gain everybody's approval. And our life is just shaky, but Jesus is somebody who will listen to my preaching, listen to my word. They build their house. It's like someone who built their house on a rock, concrete. The rains will come, all that stuff, but they still continue to stand. Men's hearts failing them for fear right now in this day and hour in which we live. Jesus said that would happen. The closer it comes to the coming of the Lord, people, there's hearts failing them for fear because nobody knows where to look for some sort of stability, but it's found in God's word. The fool will reject it. The fool will get angry and not listen to any kind of instruction, but the wise is always getting wiser. You know what? A fool, this is, this is scripture, you can find this in Proverbs. A fool will say, he don't want any instruction. Oh, I know how to do that. I can do it myself. I don't need anybody else. But a true wise person is always trying to find somebody smarter than him or her. A wise person knows, okay, I may be, <coughs> excuse me, I may be smart, but I don't know it all. And so I need to learn more. So how long have you been saved? What do you know right now, however long you've been saved? What do you know about God? What do you know about the Bible? Are you content? You think, okay, well, I know enough to be saved and I know enough to escape hell. Or is there something in you that thinks, I got to know more. I got to know him better. I got to know, not, and it's not just about being able to memorize scripture and know what the Bible says. I got to know God. I got to know God. I, he, I, God has got to have a little bit more of me so that I can be a little bit more like him. A fool is content with the way he is but not the prudent, not the saved, not those who understand the power of the cross. We're always trying to multiply, right? To affect the world around us that we might lead others to Christ. I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet this morning. Bow your head with me and just reflect on yourself. Your own personal walk, where you're at with God right now in this moment. Do you know Jesus this morning as your Savior? If you have no hope at this fear of what happens to me when I die, the smartest thing you can do, the most foolish thing you can do is ignore God dealing with your heart right now. Because he is and he will. God is faithful that when we're not saved, when we don't know him, God is faithful to deal with our hearts. The most foolish thing you can do is ignore God's voice today and walk out of this building the same way you came in. The smartest thing you can do is just simply Start by saying, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. 
your will in my life, God. Forgive me for my sins. Come into my life. And watch God begin to do a work in you. You'll be amazed at what God can do in your life. A fool just accepts things the way they are and thinks that nothing could ever change. That's not true according to the gospel. God can change so many things. But above all things, he can change your heart. He can take away that fear that maybe you have. Debilitating fear. Fear of the future, fear of eternity for sure if you don't know Jesus. Maybe you just you live, you watch the news and you live in this constant fear of what's going on in the world around us. And God would come along and say, no, 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 no don't. That's foolish to worry about the world because I've conquered the world. I've overcome the world. And if you put your trust in me, you too can overcome the world. That's the promise of his word. Let God do a work in, here, in you today. I'm gonna pray this morning. And again, every head bowed, every eyes closed, just, just being, you, you work on your relationship with God personally. These altars are open. If God is compelling you today to be saved, we invite you to come to step out of your seat and just make a bold proclamation. I'm gonna do the smartest, I'm no longer a fool. I believe in God and I'm giving my life to him. Father, we love you today. We can do nothing without you. Your word comes and it, it cuts like a knife. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. Sometimes the hardest thing for us to take is to see us ourselves as we truly are Lord to bring our foolishness to the surface so that we might see ourselves as you see us and we can all confess to you today Lord we have been so foolish we put so much emphasis on this world and it's something that is so temporary that will all be taken away readjust our focus here today each one of us help us God to see and look forward make preparations for tomorrow for that day that we'll stand before you and be judged for how foolish or how wise we were with our time here on this earth your spirit can do more in a heart in minutes in seconds than I can do in a 30 minute sermon have your way in this place today, God. We need you this morning. Anybody at all today? What's God need to do in your life? What do you need to turn over? What are you carrying that you don't need to be carrying? What burdens do you carry today? And it seems so big and it seems like something you're gonna, and, and something that maybe God would look at you and say, oh, that's silly, that's foolish. 